see the mad people of Sydney, Australia. This particular tour is called the Guilty Pleasures Tour and it's uh, down around uh, Australia and New Zealand at the moment. We're doing 11 shows in total. We're doing on average 10,000 people a night, so that's going to be around about 100,000 people over the, over the time period. When uh, an artist is offered a tour of anywhere, whether it's the UK, Europe or Australia or the Far East or even in the US, the, the information the, originally would come through the agent to the manager and, and a tour manager like myself is given uh, a calendar and says look we're going to be this is where we're going to play on such and such a day right so once you get that you know that there is a certain steps that you have to make to make sure that everything runs smoothly so you, you find out how many you know how many people are in the band how many people will be in the crew what we're going to need for uh, flights uh, um, ground transportation and all the logistics that go into putting it all together. We have a travelling party of around 35 people. So there's uh, 10 in the band, including me. Uh, then there's uh, the rest are all crew and um, you know management and whatever. And the crew consists of the backline guys, lighting, sound, um, the production manager, uh, wardrobe. We're, we've got the show into six tractor trailers. They're 48 feet long each one um, so we've got a lot of equipment we're carrying our own lights sound video screen that's on stage the video screen itself probably weighs a couple of tons we have our own riggers on the road and we then pick up as we go of course we have to pick up stage hands and some carpenters and riggers in each of the venues so we probably take on locally i would say somewhere in the region 50 or 60 other hands so it's quite a little army we have, you know, we have, we have uh, caterers everywhere we go because uh, as Napoleon said, an army marches best on its stomach and this is no different. A typical um, a show day would be the crew would come in early in the morning around 8 a.m. And then the band would show up at at four o'clock in the afternoon to do a sound check which normally runs till five o'clock. Meet 
is in his dressing room uh, taking care of signing memorabilia that then is given at the meet and greet that he does every day. He'll do a meet and greet at 6.30 or 6 o'clock. I knew that was coming. I, and that's why I asked her. So I asked her that question. <laughs> yeah, look it up. All right. Meet's one of those personalities that when he's in a room, you absolutely know he's there. He's, he's full of life, full of passion, uh, um, full of humor. I think that Meatloaf's relationship with his fans is very special in that uh, they have stuck with him uh, throughout all these years and they've lifted him up when he's needed to be lifted and he turns that around and he lifts them, them up when they need, need, need a lift as well. If you will, I would like to say this to all the fans that have been here since 1978 and beyond. You are the true fans. You are steadfast. You are loyal. And we all love you deeply. And if you would allow me, thank you for being here tonight in Sydney, in this building, with this band, with me, and with you. Thank you. Very, very much thank you. Meat is one of these um, interesting uh, artists that uh, he knows who he is, he knows he's a product, and he knows how to market it from A to Z. I mean, he's been at it a long time, but he still is a, very much a, the, the creative force behind the whole, the whole deal. Working with Meatloaf can uh, can be different to other artists. Some artists uh, get involved, you know, a little bit. Some of them don't get involved at all. They leave it, you know. They look at a picture of something that is, you know, that is presented to them and say, yeah, that's okay, or change that, or change that. Um, with Meatloaf, it's very different. Meatloaf is, you know, it's all his ideas. He he dreams up things that. You know, we all look at him like he's got two heads sometimes thinking, where on earth is this coming from? But when you see it, you go, oh, okay, I get it now. Working with me has been an uh, amazing experience for me. I have been working with him since I did his autobiography years ago. And so I've had a really good chance to kind of get to know him, both as an artist, as a person, as a friend. And he and I have played together in a lot of different arenas on a couple of albums, did a couple of music videos for him. And when this project came around, he came to me with uh, just a big old docket full of ideas and walked me through precisely what he wanted to do. He's one of those rare artists that truly has a vision and kind of knows how to do it. He knows every single thing that's going on on this tour. He wants to know everything. He wants to know his, uh, all his crew. He wants to know everybody. He knows all the gags. He knows everything that's going to happen. And he comes up with, with pretty much everything. Um, Billy, who's, a, who's the lighting designer here forever, himself and Billy sit down and go through stuff over and over and over to get it right. And, um, you know, I suppose he is probably one artist that is 100% involved in everything. So to make it louder, just a little, little top end on it. You do the snare drum for me. That's, that's, yeah, okay. Yeah, because it, when it gets loud, it kind of gets... It kind of spreads out and doesn't do anything, but if it's kind of, you're good, you're good. He's completely involved in every detail of the show creatively, and he's always thinking, he's always refining his concepts, you know, so he's, he's got that kind of an active, creative mind, and I think that it probably comes from his, up, you know, his upbringing in theater, which is where he started, where he was very much into the... Um, the show, you know, the, you know the, the performance in terms of a theater setting, which is, you know, which is where he kind of, you know, cut his, cut his teeth, let's say. My entire career has been nothing but um, a start and a stop. I'll be uh, cruising down the highway thinking everything's going along just fine, and all of a sudden I find myself in a uh, avalanche that came off of Mount Everest. There's been a lot of things written about me lately that I don't care. Yeah. 
the minute that they can walk in my shoes and be where I am, then they'll know where I was. It's never been easy. I've always felt like at a carnival, you know how they, they have the rifle ranges and they, you know, they, you shoot and you get the bear. And I always felt like one of those ducks that roll through the uh, shooting gallery and that everybody in the world wants to shoot at me and try to knock me over somehow. So, and I'm, and I'm constantly probably getting shot a lot, but then when it comes back around, I'm flipped back up again and I'm rolling again. And, then they miss for a while and then they shoot again. I'd always fought with producers that I wanted my band to play. And I kept saying, you have no idea how good my band is. One, two. Uh, woo. What do we got? What do we got? Yeah. And they had no idea how good this drummer is, John Michelli. Uh, now they do. Now they all wish they had him. They had no idea how good Randy was. And then you add uh, the, the young, the young ones to it. Real study, musical, genius is thrown around a lot. The thing with like Justin, for example, is Justin's like I am. He doesn't think. He just plays. And he lets it come from his heart. On a hot summer night, would you offer your throat to the wolf with the red rose? Will he offer me his mouth? Yes. Will he offer me his teeth? Yes. Will he offer me his jaws? Yes. Will he offer me his hunger? Yes. Again, will he offer me his hunger? Yes. Yes. On a hot summer night, would 
you offer your throat to the wolf with the red roses? Yes. I bet you say that to all the boys. They've worked and they've studied and they've Juilliarded it and they've done then their homework and it's like when you hear golfers a, a golfer will go out on a golf course and say when I'm out on a golf course yes I practice I practice I practice and when I'm on a golf course I can't think anymore and that's how it should be on a stage when you're on a stage there should be no thinking it should just it should just be on go um, and 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 actually as Nigel said in Spinal Tap it, you go one more, we go to 11. very much that they, they, they do a show and it's, it's just you know it's the same thing night after night and it's just you can literally set your watch by it. Meatloaf is not that. Well from a manager's point of view dealing with Meatloaf uh, in, and the fact that he is spontaneous and can change his mind and, and shift gears and go in a different direction than he was doing just minutes before keeps you on your toes. You could literally show up one day thinking you're doing one thing and find out very quickly that it's going to be something different and that's kind of the charm about him and what I like working on projects with him the reason being that he is so spontaneous I, li I like that about him I actually encourage that because that keeps um, everything fresh and creative and anybody who's been to a Meat Love show will know that he will change things he will be very spontaneous he will pick on somebody in the audience he will notice something and he'll he'll twist the whole thing and, uh, and make it part of the show and uh, in that way, he is, he is very unique. But, you know, he's from a, a, a sort of, you know, he's an actor. So, you know, he's from a theatrical movie background. So, you know, he's, using, he's used to ad-libbing, and he's, he is a great ad-libber, and he will turn the whole thing. And in a, in, in a guy like Meatloaf, his mind is always working, so you have to expect that. You have to expect that he's going to change, you know, something about the day or the night, and it's going to be reflected in the show that he puts on that, that evening. Just a jump to the left. Australia was really kind in in uh, in '93 with anything for love, and um, uh, we came down here for Hankel Teddy Bear. So I thought, what better place to do it than Australia for Hell in a Handbasket? Before we start something, I always have a in my head an idea, a message, a storyline, every album. It just comes from the theater background. I mean, that was why the Jim Steinman and myself was a perfect combination, because we thought so much alike as far as building storylines and, and making characters work. And for this one, this was the first time I didn't use characters. I used uh, myself, and I used the world as I see it as a background. And um, what I'm loving so far from the people that have heard it is all the explanations of why I did certain songs. I don't disagree with them. I'm not gonna tell you they're right or they're wrong, but they have. But that's the great thing. They're doing exactly what I want them to do is to put themselves in those shoes and come up with their own reasons why I did this song, why I'm doing this, why this happened, why is this going on? It has nothing to do with my reality whatsoever. Well, what makes this album different than any of the others is that usually you do back-to-back -back albums when you're like 23, 24, not when you're 63, 64. And 
I think Hell in a Handbasket is the most accessible record we've ever done. Most of the people that I collaborate with, I've known for a long time, their egos are checked at the door. Like, we had people come out for a Hinkle Teddy Bear and they came with their their press agents and their manicurist and their hairstylist and their, and Jack Black just drove up in his car and called me and said, me, I'm here, where, where am I going? I went out and met him and, and um, people like Brian May I've known for years, uh, Steve Vai, the, these guys, they are doing a long time, so they, they uh, for Hankel Teddy Bear. On this one, um, Lil John is who Lil John is. And, and then on also, we had on this record, the godfather of rap, who is Chuck D from Public Enemy. And um, he checked his ego before he ever started. I mean, his ego never came to, I mean, he's got, every artist has an ego or they couldn't play, but I'm talking about, you know, the, the over the top ego. Um, but uh, Chuck D, uh, for Chuck D to be on this record on Hell in a Handbasket is such an honor and such a privilege. Do I think that Lil John and Chuck D elevated this record, yes, I do, absolutely, positively, without a doubt. I'm honored and grateful that, that people play on the records. I mean, I, I'm thanking them, they don't thank me. This was hands down, uh, with the help of Paul Crook, who produced this record, who made this record viable, accessible, commercial, and and it is a well-spoken record. It says what it means. And, and it, it's just, he just, he made it happen. He's, he's really just, it wasn't until two years ago I had, I, that I knew what he could do. There was people around us that were holding people back. And at some point, we had to lose those people. And when that, when we lost those people, a whole different um, uh, color palette opened uh, in the meatloaf world. And I let those colors shine bright on this one. I really, at this point, want people to stop talking about bad out of hell. I'm glad you enjoyed it, but forget it. This is a completely different uh, road, a completely different highway. In fact, it's off. Uh, it's on another planet. If you want to go that far. Come crawling on back to you. And I just go away from bad out of hell and deal with hell in a handbasket, and deal with it for what it is, and stop trying to compare it to bat out of hell or bat two or bat three or bat anything. There are no comparisons to any other record that I have done. And it's the most Meatloaf record that's ever been done. Meat's performances um, are high energy. I've no idea how Meatloaf uh, stays going every night. He's, his show is uh, so full on all the time. 
Meat is a very kind of passionate individual. Everything that he takes on, he kind of jumps in 100%. There is no 90% with him. Every time I've ever met him, whether it's a photo shoot or the cover for an album or a music video, he literally pours everything he has into it. He has a very serious routine during the day. He turns up about 3.15 in the afternoon, he warms up, he goes through the sound check, he goes back into further warm up of his voice and everything like that. I'm bad out of hell. On the first line. Uh -huh. Don't follow me. Just keep, sh keep tread. Let me follow you. Okay. Push me. Okay. Because what happens is <laughs> we're we're I'm saying one thing and you're going, oh, he's oh. doing this, and you're pulling back. And you know how I like to keep that line together. Okay. Someone's okay. screaming in the fires are way down in the valley tonight. Right, right, right. I mean, make it faster than anything else on the other night. It's when we get that edge out there. <clears throat> For the size of this show, I'd say we're a very lean, mean fight machine. We're a very tight unit. Um, and uh, the work gets done. But all the guys out here, band, crew, Everybody works in unison together, and that's what pulls off a show for me. That's what makes it happen. So, Paul, yes, sir. stage left through that door, Thank stage you. right through this door, Thank okay? You. John Michelli. Yes, sir. You'll do whatever you do. Uh, <laughs> and if you don't, no point. No point. And if you don't, I want to go get a hot dog first. <laughs> Meatloaf, when he goes on that stage, he goes 100, 110 percent every night. Uh, he leaves nothing in the dressing room, as they say. All right, All right, let's, go. All right let's kill. Here we go. Okay. Oh, All right, guys. He's out there giving everything he's got to his to his fans. Here we go. Here we go. What are we gonna do? Kill. What do we need to do? Kill. What do we always do? Kill. What do we need to do? Kill. Yeah, shaking bit. artist that feeds off the energy from the audience as well so that uh, his crowds uh, are the, the dedicated meatheads or meat fans or whatever they call themselves and so he, he, he feeds off that The energy, where does it come from? It comes from probably just the adrenaline that you know one feels when they walk out in front of a mass of people and they know they have to deliver the show of their life. You know, as we know, he does two, two and a half hours and sometimes we have it scheduled for two hours and we just look and we go, well, there's the two hours gone, it's now two and a half because he's enjoying himself and he's just getting completely into the show. But that's, again, one of the unique things about the man. You know, at 64 years old, it's. It's incredible, it really is. He's in his own world up there. He's, in, he's, he's captain of his own universe up there. He's the ringmaster. He knows for that two hours or two hours and 15 minutes or 20 minutes, whatever it might be, um, he's giving it to the audience.
And I swear, I think that he really thinks this could be the last show that he ever does. Every night he goes out there, he gives it everything he's got. When that show is over, he is exhausted. I mean, he literally is completely spent. To him, it's all about giving it his all and putting his passion into everything that he does. And I think that's what drives him. And I think that's an amazing quality. And I give him a lot of credit for that because not, not a lot of performers will do that. He goes that extra mile for his fans because he really loves his fans. I think Meaton has stood the test of time because he has always stayed true to who he is. He hasn't tried to go with the current trend or he's been himself to the point of wearing himself down and, and putting everything into it and I think that's why he's succeeded as long as he has is because he does give it his all. Well, I think that Meatloaf is a global phenomenon because he has continually put his best foot forward every time he goes out. Uh, with, with, with an album and, and with a tour. Music today doesn't tr translate the same way anymore. We're in a different world now. Um, music isn't the thing that brings the young people together. Video games are and uh, the internet and uh, Facebook and all the rest of this stuff. But when Meat started, as with a lot of artists in the 70s, you know, you can talk about Elton John and Rod Stewart and Eric Clapton and these people have got followings that are loyal to them. And Meat was very, very much a part of that legacy from that, that, those, those eras. And these people have grown up with it. They've got, they've still, you know, they had the album and the album went to cassette tape, they got it on cassette, then it went to CDs, they've got it on CDs, now they're buying DVDs. You know, they've got it and they've, they've, they've continued to buy everything in those formats. Um, and when he, they get the opportunity to go and see them, now they're bringing their kids along with them. He never um, just rests uh, on his laurels. He never is satisfied with what he's done in the past. He's always thinking of something greater for the future. And therefore, he has this career that's spanning 40 years. And I think you have to uh, uh, give him the credit uh, for wanting to always do better. My problem is, and it's always been this, I'm always thinking more artistically. Anytime I see anybody struggle, and you can tell that they really care about what they're doing, my heart reaches out to them. Because you get judged a lot in this business, and far be it from me to judge. You can't look at the guy and think that he's doing it half-assed because he absolutely brings it every single time he's in front of a camera or if he's meeting someone. Just his general presence is he lives and breathes as a performer and I think that resonates in everything that he does. The question is when the lights go down and the music is stopped from a show what do I think about? <laughs> the answer to that is the next show <laughs> and how that it can be better than the show that we just did. That's what I think about. How can I make that next night better for the fans and for anyone to ever question my loyalty and how I feel about my fans they don't know me very well and maybe not every night I walk out on that stage is that show going to be perfect but I'll be damned if I don't try to make it perfect and I will leave nothing on that stage because there's only thing that matters is the people that are sitting out there it's not the typical band walks on and waves their arms and says to the fans oh aren't you glad we're here i go the other way i look at them and i go i'm so glad you're here and you know this, this may not be perfect tonight but damn if i'm not going to die trying Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> my, my little Dixie cup. <laughs>